So I'm also going to go dark. It was good to see you, Dave. You too. Thank you. Okay, so I'll go ahead and start making some announcements. Um, good morning or good afternoon, everybody. My name is Rachel Hasna. I'm with uh, the University of New Mexico's uh, Community Division for Community Behavioral Health. This is our Law and Mental Health Didactic Series. Thank you for joining us. Just a couple of quick announcements regarding our CEU process. So we will submit a link to an evaluation in the chat. Um, if you just toggle your mouse to the bottom of your screen where the menu pops up, there's a chat icon, you'll click that. That's where you can find the evaluation link. Uh, click on it, fill out the evaluation, a certificate of completion is automatically generated for you. It is your responsibility to save it. We do not email copies. So uh, if you're joining from your smartphone, you'll wanna take a screenshot of the document. If you're on your computer, you can just save it as a Word or a PDF. Uh, if you're joining us by phone um, and you're just listening in and you need the link, just email me and we're happy to send you the link via email. Um, we will be recording today. We can also, uh, and we'll also be sharing the slides with everybody who's registered uh, towards the end of the week. And I just wanted to remind folks that uh, there are captions. So if you also uh, toggle the bottom menu, there should be an option to uh, show subtitles. So you'll have to click that option um, in order to see the subtitles. And I'll hand it over to Julie. Thanks, Rachel. Um, welcome everybody to the University of New Mexico Law and Mental Health Didactic Series. This series is hosted by the University of New Mexico Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences and the New Mexico Behavioral Health Services Division. Um, we're so glad to have you all here to join us today. My name is Julie Bravko. I'm an assistant clinical professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. So first I want to remind you uh, to join us next week. At that time we have Dr. Barry Rosenfield who's presenting Navigating Language and Culture in the Assessment of Malingering. Next for our talk today, um, please ask questions in the Q&A anytime you feel comfortable, but just know we probably won't get to them until the end. Also, as always, we do try to get to as many of your questions as possible, but please forgive us if we can't get to yours. Um, for those of you who want CEs but are on a tight schedule, um, you do have to stay for that full hour, but we will let you know um, when the hour has passed and the talk is officially over, just know we will probably be staying on longer to try and address more of your questions. So now it's time for what we've all been waiting for. I'd like to introduce to you our speaker for today, Dr. Dave Lexton. Dr. Lexton is a nationally recognized expert and trainer in suicide prevention, in telehealth and innovative technologies in behavioral health care. He is the Director of Research and Data Analytics at Washington State Department of Corrections and an associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at the University of Washington School of Medicine. Dr. Lexton previously served as the principal investig investigator of the Millennium Cohort Study, the largest prospective health study in the US military history. Before that, he served as a research psychologist and program manager at the National Center for Telehealth and Technology. He's a seasoned researcher and has authored more than 100 scientific articles and book chapters and published three books, including A Practitioner's Guide to Telemental Health in 2016. He's also helped to develop national guidelines for telemental health and clinical best practices in the use of technology and behavioral health care. 
He's a licensed clinical psychologist and served in the US Air Force. Dr. Lexon, we're so grateful to have you here today and for your time and expertise. Um, on behalf of the University of New Mexico, I'd like to welcome and thank you for presenting today. I'm now gonna turn it over to you. Excellent, thank you so much. It is my pleasure uh, to be giving this presentation today. And um, we, we will have time for questions. So if you do have questions along the way, which I'm sure you will, go ahead and throw those into the, the chat box or the, the question box and we'll get to those at the end. And I will give you my email at the end as well. So if there's any articles or any other kind of questions that you may have uh, or articles that you'd like to request, um, I'm gonna show you a few of those. Uh, go ahead and send those requests to me. I'll be happy to send those to you. So what I've done here is I've condensed something that is um, probably several hours worth of training into one, one session, one hour training. So I'm gonna do my best to, to get through it um, quickly, but still have um, some time for some questions, as I said. So I have no financial relationship uh, to the program. And the views expressed in this presentation are those of the speaker, me. Uh, they do not necessarily represent the views or policies or positions of the University of New Mexico. And learning objectives. So this workshop is designed to help you to understand the ethical and legal considerations of conducting forensic competency evaluations with video conferencing, knowing when video conferencing is and is not appropriate, how to select and use appropriate technology, to understand appropriate methods, including safety protocols, and best practices for working with attorneys, interpreters, and more, and also best practices for writing and documentation. So I wanna start with a few of the need to know terms. So you'll hear the term originating site. This refers to the location of the person other than where you, the provider or the professional is located. So this is where your client is located. The distance site is where you are, where the professional is or the healthcare professional uh, who's providing the service. Synchronous versus asynchronous. Synchronous just means two directions at one time. So for example, uh, traditional uh, talking on a telephone or video conferencing, it's communication two ways at the same time. Asynchronous is one way at a time. So this is things like you know, doing email or text messaging or, or faxing, for example. Store, it, store and forward technology is asynchronous transmission. When you uh, gather some data, whether it's even like a photograph, for example, or some other kind of uh, uh, electronic information, and then it's stored and then shared at a later point in time. Again, fax and email is a great example of this. So some background. So there has been nationally an increasing demand to complete in-jail evaluations and frankly, evaluations, forensic evaluations in any setting, including in forensic hospitals. Uh, there's a time limit um, on, uh, that's imposed on um, in many states, certainly here in Washington, it's 14 days or less that they have to be done or the state gets fined. There are delays due to travel time to some jails, of course, experiencing scheduling challenges. And defense attorneys are not always available when you would like to, to conduct your evaluation. So you have to work around those schedules. And then obviously in this time that we're in with COVID-19, the requirements for social distancing and sometimes quarantine requirements has really imposed restrictions on the ability to do in-person evaluations. So some of the benefits of using video conferencing is that reduced waste, wait time for defendants in jail it's more convenient. Secure video conferencing can allow forensic evaluators to conduct interviews remotely and also allow attorneys to attend remotely. Greater efficiency at completing court ordered competency to stand trial evaluations. Safety, in other words, um, you are um, not in the same physical environment as a client who um, potentially having to transport that person who's in jail to a room and some of the, the potential risks that are involved in that. And also if you think about uh, in times of um, infectious disease and pandemic, uh, it's more safe to be video conferencing. And video conferencing can also be used for other purposes, such as court hearings, training, and more. So some of the particular advantages during this time that we find ourselves in now is that when masks are required in person, VC has an obvious advantage here because the client can remove the mask during the video conferencing assessment if they're alone in the room, socially distanced. Uh, you can't catch a virus over VC and reduce uh, risk screening burden um, entering facilities. So if you've been going to facilities during this time, 
uh, as I have when I go into the office, you have to do a, you know, get your temperature taken, go through a screening questionnaire, and obviously you're wearing a mask and uh, washing your hands a lot. And so this um, allows you to do this really from the comfort of your own office or home. Some of the potential challenges though, are that there's often resistance to adoption by attorneys in courts. Now this has been obviously changing over the last year, especially, uh, but there still is some resistance out there or um, uncertainty about the validity of doing video conferencing. And we're gonna get into that here in just a bit. Um, lack of staff training, impacting skill competence, confidence in potential safety or legal challenges, technology problems, uh, not knowing what is acceptable acceptable to use for technology and connection issues and problems with originating in coordination, including client staff safety. So as I mentioned before, that video conferencing allows you to be remote from where your client is, but if they're being moved into a particular room, uh, jail staff, for example, or hospital staff, they still have to move that person and make them available um, for your session. So in regards to the evidence base, this is growing and we're going to see a lot more published papers coming out uh, in the next year or so because of really the pandemic and everyone realizing video conferencing is a necessity and it's, um, it's not something that's just going to go away now, it's going to be more prevalent. So video based, uh, video conferencing based evaluations have been tested and shown to be reliable, uh, they are equal or um, higher satisfaction by defendants and practitioners. Now there's some variation in that. I mean, you, there's always examples of where it may not go well. Again, if you're having technical problems, you lose the connection. Um, and we're gonna get into a little bit more of some of the nuances of that here in a minute. But in general, the published available research literature suggests that uh, they are just as reliable as doing it as in person. Uh, this is a paper that um, we published here just recently in the last two years. This was the first pilot study of uh, forensic uh, video conferencing done here in the state of Washington, where we set up um, video conferencing in four jails as part of a pilot study and connected them with the state hospitals and were able to pilot it here. And it's now gone statewide and um, our evaluators are doing it quite often here. So let's talk about some of the legal and regulatory considerations. So secure video conferencing is used by the courts nationally already, and it's been, been used for years, uh, primarily for pretrial proceedings, such as doing initial appearances, bail and arraignment. Uh, it's used for uh, testimony, grand jury proceedings, and also examination or cross-examination of witnesses. Now, case law has supported the use of video conferencing for involuntary commitment, and US states have implemented programs to evaluate the feasibility of using video conferencing for such hearings. The Federal Rules of Criminal Procedure, uh, Title uh, 9, Rule 43, require that defendants be present, in other words, physically in the room during the initial appearance, the initial arrangement, the plea, or every trial stage, including jury impoundment, um, or the return of the verdict and sentencing. However, exceptions to the rule allow defendants to waive these rights in certain instances, such as minor offenses, and allow trial to proceed to conclusion as a defendant absconds. Again, this is some of the existing uh, law that's in place and rules that are in place. However, I've not done a recent review of what's been kind of going on and changing, but I have these, an assumption that um, more flexibility has been allowed in this last year in regards to existing rules. However, nothing in, in Rule 43 explicitly precludes the use of video conferencing. And several district courts held that defendants can't consent to video conferencing during a plea, even if for medical or financial hardship reasons. Video conferencing has been recognized as an alternative to appearing in person for defendants with minor charges or when defendants are unable to attend. And defendants can also consent to VC for initial appearances. This is part of Rule 5 and arraignments, which is part of Rule 10. Courts have acknowledged the potential limitations associated with video conferencing relative to in-person appearance, but also note that these limitations do not necessarily cause an individual to be denied due process. Now, keep in mind, this is review that we've published. We, one of the first things that we did here in Washington was let's look at the, the, the legal requirements or, or laws regarding video conferencing to see if we're gonna run into any challenges, uh, legal challenges when we start to pilot and then implement this in the state. 
So here's some arguments that I've encountered in over the last year, I've done a number of um, kind of professional uh, consulting things regarding forensic video conferencing. And some of the things that come up are, are these things. So remote competency examinations cannot be done securely and without intrusion by persons other than the examiner and the subject. Okay. Um, Delbert and Merrill Dow Pharmaceuticals, um, there's a trial uh, and the result said, let's see, trial court must determine whether scientific evidence is both relevant and reliable, okay? But whether the theory or technique in question can be and has been tested and whether it has been subjected to peer review and publication, uh, it's known or potential error rate or the existence and maintenance of standards controlling its operation and whether it has attracted widespread acceptance within a a relevant scientific community. Okay, so this has been a real challenge that was um, in another state, I'm not gonna say where, that um, had come up, I wish I consulted on. And I argued that if you compare doing video conferencing for uh, forensic evaluations that forensic, forensic or um, video conferencing is done all the time in the field of healthcare. And I view, and the, really the profession views, video conferencing as being a medium. It's not the actual treatment or the evaluation itself. It's just the medium of doing it. So that if you can replicate the conditions and the procedures that you would normally do as in person, really there isn't a whole lot different from it. Of course, there are some differences and I'm gonna talk more about those here in a minute, but those differences aren't things that should preclude, preclude you from actually just doing the evaluation over video conferencing. So a little bit more about my opinion on this. Um, there is precedence for these video conferencing by the courts, as I noted earlier, and in the healthcare field. There's decades of it. Competency stand trial evaluation is a different process than what may otherwise be prohibited by courts. And there's melting relevant scientific evidence of effective use for video conferencing in competency stand trial evaluations. There's an increasing widespread use and acceptance in the field, especially this, during this past year. And there's availability of secure encrypted HIPAA compliant video conferencing software. So the software itself is not a limitation and the technology is not either as long as you have a good internet connection. The conditions that could contribute to error rate are demonstrated and known and mitigated. We, we know this already. And the burden is on demonstrating the competency of the evaluator, appropriate procedures and the limits and uh, some types of testing. So again, I think what could be challenged is that if your procedures aren't following the standard recommended procedures for, for doing a forensic evaluations and doing them over video conferencing, that could be challenged. And if you, um, let's say you're doing it and you do lose your connection and you have to revert to a different method, like you switch to a telephone or you, or you have to cancel it and you have to you know, reschedule it or go back in and do it in person, those kinds of things could be challenged, but you have to demonstrate that you have completed the evaluation in a way that um, is complete. So a little bit more about professional competency. The American Psychological Association practice guidelines for forensic psychology, knowledge of the scientific foundation for opinions and testimony states, forensic practitioners seek to provide opinions and testimony that are sufficiently based upon adequate scientific foundation and reliable and valid principles and methods that have been applied appropriately to the facts of the case. When providing opinions and testimony that are based on novel or emerging principles and methods, Forensic practitioners seek to make known the status and limitations of these principles and methods. So the key points here are this, assuring that opinions and testimony are sufficiently based upon adequate scientific foundation, appropriate application of reliable and valid principles and methods, and novel emerging methods must be disclosed. So my recommendation is that when you're doing a forensic evaluation over video conferencing is that you have to assure that um, you are providing information we're gonna talk a little bit more about in reporting but to make sure you have that information in your report of that you use the technology. And if there were any conditions that would have impacted your results, you'd want to note, note those in your report. So my recommendations are to seek training specifically to, to video conferencing based evaluations like you're doing today. Uh, no legal regulatory limitations applicable to your jurisdiction know the technology, how to select and know what is appropriate and how to use and troubleshoot it if necessary. Know how to apply the appropriate procedures to include safety, interview techniques, such as pausing if there's an audio delay in between your, your phrases, and documentation when writing your report to the court. And I'm gonna get into a little bit more of the details on each of these here in a minute. 
But before that, I want to talk a bit about the psychometric and practical feasibility of video conferencing based forensic evaluations, because this is one of the areas that can get challenged. So it's important to know what is and isn't appropriate to do over video conferencing. So here are some general recommendations. What may not be appropriate requires administrators hands on administration unless feasible to have an assistant on site. So for example, if um, you're doing some kind of testing that requires hands-on and you're not at that location because you're remote, obviously you can't really do that. Um, if you do have a technician or an assistant who is on site to assist with those things, then it may be feasible. Uh, this goes on all the time in the, in the health field when doing uh, telehealth procedures or testing when you have um, someone who's on site, a technician who's assisting. Assessment testing materials, security risk, um, you have to have control over it. So a great example is doing like, like a waste um, intelligence testing or something like that. Is, I always use that example because as you all know, uh, you have to secure those materials. You can't just let them out into the public. And if you're not on site, you may have less control over things. The other thing that can happen too is if you're doing something, um, uh, certainly in the, in the um, telehealth field when you're doing a, a health um, visit, um, or you're doing any kind of testing, people can cheat on those things. They can get on the internet and they're, they're finding answers or way to respond. So um, you have to um, be cognizant of that. Uh, nothing prohibits the use of your own uh, worksheets or aid memoir. So this often comes up as a question, what about for folks who have um, psychotic symptoms and the feasibility of doing this? So psychotic features are overtly displayed through verbal expression of delusions, facial expression, body movement, catatonia, flat effect, hyper effect are all examples. And these are all things that are, are observ observable over video conferencing. You can also observe disheveled appearance over video conferencing and reaction to VC procedures can tell you something about conferencing stand trial. This is one of the things that we experienced in the first time we did it here in Washington where the, the client um, started referring to the evaluator as an automaton, um, as if they were a robot and kind of went on about that. And it was able, it was useful information in making um, an assessment of the person's mental state. Uh, this is a uh, published paper we published some years ago now, five, six, seven years ago now, it's getting, getting a little bit old, but um, it was one of the first papers of its kind. And what we did with this paper is we reviewed best practices for remote psychological assessment using telehealth technologies. I highly recommend this paper as a good kind of review of the topic. And it provides some guidance on how to select measures and tools. Um, I'm actually, this one I think is uh, free out there on the internet. You can just search it and find it. Uh, you can also email me and I'll, I'd be happy to send it to you. It's also available on my website, which I will provide to you here at the end. Uh, here's another, another paper that came out relatively recently. Uh, it's a really great paper about neuropsychological test administration via video conferencing. Highly recommend review of this paper. So let's talk about the technology requirements. So there's a, a number of vendors providing HIPAA compliant video communication products and saying that they will enter into a HIPAA uh, business associate agreement. So if you don't know this with, uh, with HIPAA, there's actually a formal agreement that the software provider has to, to do for it to be HIPAA compliant. And there's some question over whether does a forensic evaluation have to be HIPAA compliant or not. My recommendation is that why not just have that level of security and encryption when doing an evaluation? Because you are talking about health information uh, and there's private information there. And with the software that's available out there now um, off the shelf, you can just do it. So why not do it? Um, so some of the ones that um, I've had experience working with are uh, Skype for Business. Uh, Microsoft Teams can also work. Uh, Cisco WebEx meetings. This is the system that we used here in Washington for our state facilities. Uh, Zoom for Healthcare. Doxy is a pretty pretty neat one if you haven't um, tried that. Um, Doxy is, is, works really well. Uh, Updocs and VC. By the way, uh, Apple FaceTime, uh, they've not signed a BAA, so they're technically not HIPAA compliant, although they may have, um, I remember some controversy over that in the few, last few years about them doing that, and there may be a version now that does provide that, but in general, I don't think it, it is, so I, I would not recommend using it. So just some tips regarding camera and microphones. 
Definitely want to use high definition camera. I mean, these are standard these days, so it, it's pretty much a given. Um, what I have found in doing this that when doing an evaluation over video conferencing with a really good high def uh, camera and even if like a 4K camera is that it's almost too good. Like you can zoom in, you can see so many details <laughs> that it's better than in person. So you don't really need that kind of overkill, but it is um, quite impressive nowadays with the technology. I do recommend pan tilt zoom capability at the originating end where the client is. We set this up in the jails here in Washington and in the hospitals so that we could move the camera around. So if the client got up and walked around the room, we could actually observe to see where the person was moving. Uh, microphone may be integrated into the camera or it can be dedicated. We found in some situations having a separate microphone uh, worked a bit better because you get less of the room echo when a person is speaking across the room towards the, the, the uh, either the, the computer screen or a, um, a TV that has the microphone attached to it. You do want to consider room noise. As I just mentioned, you can get some echo effects that can be problematic in the evaluation. And you may want to separate the microphone as I said, like hanging it from a ceiling in some locations because um, it'll be closer to where the client is sitting and the audio is just better. So a few comments about network connectivity. As I mentioned, go for the ones that are HIPAA compliant. Uh, they will provide a secure uh, connection or encrypted uh, connection. Uh, the speed of, of the connection is super important and what I recommend is testing it before you even get started, making sure you have a good uh, transmission up and down. And there's some software out there which will allow you to test your bandwidth, but certainly do some dry runs before you even start uh, to make sure you're, you're gonna have a good connection. And uh, as I said, always test before you go live, get that connection um, set up. The way we did it in Washington, we actually wrote up a protocol for doing this and we had uh, the um, jail staff come in and actually set up the communication first before they moved the um, person into the room before we started the sessions. So let's talk a bit about the procedures. So this is a, a point that we made in a, in a paper about 10 years ago regarding what happens if a uh, your person, your client has some kind of impairment or a condition that prevents them from participating in video conferencing. Uh, in those cases, it may not be advised to do video conferencing. And some examples might be they just refuse to orient to the procedures because of their behavioral or mental health or cognitive functioning. Uh, they may be violent towards the jail staff or hospital staff or at the, the equipment. I think in, in here in Washington during our pilot study, we had one scenario where a person in jail, they they uh, got angry and tried to throw something at the screen. Uh, so that can happen. Uh, but the other big one is really just hearing and vision limitations. So if these are known ahead of time, then you have to assess you know, whether this is going to be feasible or not to do. Uh, but some of the advantages of doing video conferences is that you can actually turn up the volume. And so you can uh, have it to where it's, um, it can be loud enough for someone who might be experiencing some hearing challenges to, to participate. Uh, what I always recommend doing is, is testing that right off the get-go when you first start your session. Ask the client, hey, can you, can you hear me okay? Can you see me okay? And, and make sure that um, their experience of the, the video um, communication is adequate. Privacy is another big consideration here. Uh, there are two primary types of privacy and security issues. One is just the electronic data security. This has to do with just the encryption or uh, password protection on your computer. Uh, the other is physical privacy. This is making sure that the area um, of which where you are or where the client is are free from eavesdroppers and also assuring that documents aren't left unintended. One of the things that we experience in doing this in jails is that you, know, you might have jail staff that are off camera or they're outside the room. Typically, we'd have them outside of the room, but the, there was often um, windows for them to look in to make sure everything was going okay um, outside. And I'm gonna talk more about safety protocols here in a minute, because this is gonna be really important. Uh, electronic security, these requirements are defined, as I mentioned, by um, HIPAA, if you are, want to be HIPAA compliant. And there may be some state law regarding this too, so I recommend you take a look at that as it's applicable to you. I know here in Washington, there are some requirements about that that are uh, state level. 
And if you have any local policy on this, like your agency, wherever you work, might have specific uh, policy regarding which software is authorized to use for video conferencing. So these are some other recommendations in regards to privacy. Make sure that the uh, location of which where you are, and if you can, where your client is, uh, has adequate soundproofing. So you're not getting noise intrusions from the outside. And also that the, the voice of you and your client are being um, eavesdropped by someone on the outside. I do recommend the use of white noise generators. Um, they, they can help in some locations. Make sure the space is free from unwanted eavesdroppers. As I mentioned, uh, in this case, if you're doing uh, your sessions from home, you might have family members in the house, et cetera. So be mindful of kind of scheduling your time when you're doing the session, locking your door, whatever you need to do. Uh, and then consider staff presence, as I mentioned, like correctional officers or other medical staff in a hospital setting, uh, making sure that you have a procedure in place so that they know that when the session is going on, that's what's going on. Um, so that they're not intruding. So this is super important. And this is a topic which we've published in a number of places. And I'm gonna share some of those articles with you regarding this, the safety of doing this. And here are a couple of the primary risks. So could the defendant hang themselves on a power cord or use a laptop as a weapon? Again, I have, I have witnessed someone grab a laptop and throw it at a screen. So it can happen. Uh, can the defendant move out of sight from the camera? And what are they doing? Are they damaging something? Are they, are they harming themselves? So these are some particular risks and things to consider. Here's how you manage them. Develop safety procedures uh, and train, train your staff and make sure you receive adequate training and that those procedures are followed. And pay, what we did here in Washington is we paid special attention to make sure that at the originating site where the clients were located in jails or in hospitals, that the screens, the flat panel screens were, were really secured to the wall. In some cases, we actually had hardened plexiglass cases for them. And we made sure that all power cables and any other kind of cables were, were secured either in conduit so that they could not be grabbed or pulled off or used as a ligature or as, as a weapon. So safety planning is a necessary component of competent and ethical telepractice, and it must be practiced, and it's a must for all practitioners across telepractice settings. Safety plans are the written steps for carrying out safety procedures and emergency protocols to find the steps to be followed during emergency situations. An example of an emergency situation might be the, maybe your client's having a health condition. Um, they're having a Cardio, a heart attack during your session. And so you have to react to that. You have to call 911, um, et cetera, or call on site staff to respond to that. Um, another situation might be there's um, their behavioral situation where they're having um, acting out violently, or maybe someone's having a panic attack, for example. So it's necessary to have an established plan and to work collaboratively with the originating site staff, such as at a jail or a hospital. Um, plan who to call when an emergency occurs. So you want to do this up front. So you want to know that what your what your procedure is. So are you going to call the local jail? Like, do you have a number there for the the on duty uh, officers that you can call to assist if there's an emergency? Do you have other uh, staff, uh, medical staff that you're able to call? Um, always have a cell phone with you so that um, when you're doing your session, you can switch to a phone. And you may have to be both doing your video conferencing and be on a phone. Uh, this can happen in some scenarios where there is an emergency when you're calling someone else. And ongoing risk and behavioral assessment, monitor as you go. So you, this is something you should be doing throughout uh, at the beginning of the session and throughout your session is being mindful of what those risks are. And if you're seeing something escalate, you're seeing your client become say increasingly angry and uh, you're worried that they, they might turn violent towards the equipment or staff. Um, then you might need to do some kind of intervention at that point or, or stop the session. So here's some examples of some procedures. Um, let's kind of walk through this. So the evaluator will schedule the session and contact the attorney and contact the jail as a first step and during the scheduling process. So jail staff will move the defendant into the room and establish the video conferencing connection. Again, you may do it to where the jail staff establishes the connection first, then moves the defendant in the room. We really did it both ways here. 
but I recommend making sure you have that connection established, then moving the person uh, in case you run into any kind of technical problems. It's just easier to troubleshoot it that way. Uh, the evaluator completes the interview and assessment and attorneys may attend either in person or via video conferencing. This is something that we've done here in Washington where we allowed attorneys to log on through the internet so they can participate in a three-way video conference. Uh, we also had scenarios where the attorney was um, present with the client while the evaluator was remote. And then of course you would document your session and write a report. So a little bit about documentation. Um, report that the video conferencing procedures were used uh, and if they were completed. And I mentioned this before that you want to make sure that's documented. And if there was anything that may have impacted your assessment, you're going to want to note that because otherwise you're going to be challenged uh, regarding it. And so I would make sure you note that. If there's a scenario again where you start with video conferencing and you can't finish for some reason, you have to go in person, you'd want to note that and just how the, how the um, assessment was completed. All right, so I'm gonna provide some resources uh, for you here that I really recommend. This is a book that we published um, a few years back. It's now, um, we're now working on the second edition. Uh, this book has been a bestseller at APA this past year because of COVID. Um, I highly recommend you check out this book because it really walks you through this whole process of um, setting up a practice for doing video conferencing, uh, all the safety procedures and considerations and documentation recommendations, and also the legal and ethical issues that are related to it. One of the things that we're doing in the revision for this is we're including some more content about doing forensic evaluations or, or uh, doing video conferencing in, in forensic settings, uh, which will be a new addition. Highly recommend you check out the American Telemedicine Association's practice guidelines for telemental health. Uh, they um, really kind of lay out um, really all the recommendations for uh, doing it and doing it ethically. I recommend you check out uh, this article that we published uh, a few years ago, uh, Forensic Competency Evaluations via Video Conferencing, Feasibility Review, and Best Practice Recommendations. And what we did with this paper is we summarized really the best practices for doing it, and we will kind of walk you through it. So I highly recommend that you check out this article. This article uh, really gets into safety planning and it was one of the first articles of its kind um, where we reviewed all of the safety types of issues that could occur or risks that could occur and kind of walk through how to plan for um, those risks and how to develop formal safety plans for your telepractice. So in summary, know the laws and rules in your local jurisdiction have established procedures and protocols in place. And what I recommend there is that if, if they're not already existing, like um, wherever you work, if they don't have these things kind of written out as policies and procedures, is that you write them out yourself so that you, you have something to refer to, like th these are the steps that I take when doing uh, video conferencing based evaluations. And then seek training and maintain competencies uh, in doing video conferencing. Um, there's tons of training out there um, that you can take on just general uh, telemental health or telebehavioral health or telemedicine. Um, I've seen less actually specifically on this topic. That's why I've been trying to get out and, and train on this because I know there's a high need for uh, forensic evaluators to have this training. And what I have found that just as it is in the, the healthcare field and in telemedicine is that if it's something you haven't done before, you're just anxious about it and you're unsure about it. You don't know what you don't know. So you want to you want to learn more about it. And that's where the training really comes in is um, learning that you can actually do it and to um, do it in a way that you have everything planned out ahead of time and then go through that first session and you'll feel much more confident after the first few times that you do it. So in conclusion, video conferencing based forensic competency evaluations is about addressing for who, when, and how it is appropriate and whether the pros outweigh any of the possible cons. Now, this is a very general statement, but this is the same thing that I would recommend for evaluating whether or not you should do, say, healthcare over video conferencing, is that you have to weigh the pros and cons of doing it. And with the pandemic, we've been really forced into using video conferencing for so many things, and it's become the new normal. 
And we've learned a lot by doing this and we've learned just how feasible it is. And that I think it's opened a way for us to continue to do um, much more um, work, including forensic evaluations via video conferencing as we move into the future. So what I'd like to do is um, switch over to some q and I'm sure you're going to have lots of those. Um, this, was, again, was something very condensed. I usually would spend hours in a workshop kind of going through all the nuances of everything and maybe showing you some more of the documentation and things. But I have uh, put together these articles that I presented to you and some other information at my website. And you can also just email me. I'm happy to send them to you. And I, I highly recommend that you read through these, um, these papers and check out some of these other resources. Um, I, I find them to be very helpful. So let's go to some questions. All right, thank you so much. Um, first person says, do you know which video conferencing apps don't require the originator to download and install software? Ah, uh, even Zoom has a capability to where you can do it off the web, off your browser. So um, a number of them do that. Doxy, I believe, does it that way. Um, and a lot of them have the option for both, where you can download it or just do it off the web browser. My recommendation is to find the ones that allow you to do it off the web browser, just for those reasons. Certainly, if you're working with attorneys or interpreters uh, and, you, and they want to participate, uh, the ones that are web-based make a lot of sense. This so next individual says, you referred to the published available literature, and from what they can find, what's published and available primarily looks at VC evals as they relate to competency, as opposed to, for example, diminished capacity or sanity, et cetera. Do you have thoughts on things to consider regarding the utilization of VC for other kinds of evaluations with arguably higher stakes? Yeah, excellent question. So as I mentioned um, a few years ago, when we were first looking into doing this, we did a pretty comprehensive literature review uh, in across uh, legal settings and using video conferencing. So that paper by Luxon and Lexin from 20, I think it's 18, we published it. Um, that one has a pretty good review in it on this topic. Um, you know, I think it's, um, as I mentioned, there's been definitely um, in the last year, a lot of um, questioning about the feasibility of doing this, uh, definitely for competency evaluation. Um, I think that um, if you look at the literature, there are examples of where it's being challenged for things such as um, uh, insanity, et cetera. And often it's been where the healthcare, the provider needs to be in the same room when doing those kinds of assessments. And that has been challenged. And I know of at least one case, I can't recall the name of it now where it was challenged in court. Um, so I don't really have a, a really a definite answer on that. I think we're going to see more, as I said, uh, pu studies published and more um, allowances of doing video conferencing for these other things, particularly because of the, the pandemic. So I, th I think it's something that we need to look out for. This next person, I think is it's more of a comment, but um, a, they're saying a BAA is only available if the psychologist has control over the platform used for the VC. When interviewing someone in jail, however, it's the jail that has the platform and the BAA is not available to the psychologist. True, but if you're using these software programs such as the ones that I listed that meet HIPAA compliance, you're gonna be fine, it doesn't really matter. Um, people are using this all across the country. They're using Doxy and Zoom for healthcare, et cetera, uh, for doing uh, healthcare, which requires HIPAA. So as I said, if you're using those, those authorized programs, you should be fine. Sort of along those same lines, this person says they're limited to the program used by the jail, which is regular Zoom, not for healthcare. Do you have thoughts on this? Um, so far, this person is saying no attorneys have objected. Yeah, you know, um, I get frustrated with this one because it's like the software is still encrypted. You know what I mean? It's just the sort of technicality of it. Uh, it drives me nuts uh, because even FaceTime technically is encrypted. But the issue might be that there's, there, is there someone eavesdropping on it? Is there uh, something kind of going on behind the scenes with the data that's being transferred, right? And there's no guarantee. So that's the problem. Um, 
I think I, I would look at that one as, as sort of a local issue and, and what the policies are regarding it. Um, uh, again, I, I really recommend using the stuff that is HIPAA compliant for these reasons in case it gets challenged, but if it's not getting challenged, uh, is, is someone breaking a law or a federal law? I don't necessarily think so. Like I said, there's a difference between a forensic evaluation and a, a healthcare session, um, but I'd probably look at it at the local level and, and um, make that assessment. This next person says, given that it's difficult to build rapport, as given that it's difficult to build rapport as it is with some of these, some of those with serious mental illness and the severe limitations in resources of some employers, for example, providing a secure connection, adequate laptops or IT help. How do you argue for doing evaluations with VC as convenient as it may seem? With a psychotic individual, for example, you can only observe the third upper, the upper third of their body. So you can't see what they're doing with their hands, for example. So this person would argue it's not the same as assessing in person. Also, how do you factor out VC as a variable when it comes to the defendant's reactions? For example, how do you know that they would have reacted in the same way in person? Yeah, great questions. So for the first part, as I said, you can, you know, zoom out and you can pan around if, if your camera allows that, the connection allows that. And so you can actually observe quite a bit. Um, you know, that my last slide was weighing the pros and cons, right? And so all things being equal, if it's, if it's more beneficial to go in person than it is over video conferencing, then go in person and just do it if you're worried about it. But if the situation um, suggests that it's this more, not just by convenience, by, by necessity to use video conferencing, then you're willing to take some of, you're willing to lose something to do that for that capability. And I certainly acknowledge that because it's not the same. Doing something over video conferencing is not the same as being in person. Um, you can also get information though from the collaterals, like from the, the officers that may be in the room or uh, observing the person come into the room or exiting the room, those kinds of things are sources of information. But um, uh, again, it's, it's kind of like, it's a judgment you have to make as the professional or as an organization, whether you're going to uh, limit it. Uh, this is something that can come up in courts where they can argue, you know, did you, you, you can't do this because you can't observe everything. You can't smell the clients, you know, which is a source of information, you know. Um, this has been going on in the healthcare field, this debate for, for many years. And, um, and as I said, we are now in a world where we're doing so much more video conferencing and showing that it is just as reliable as doing it as in person. Um, but I think at the end of the day, it's a judgment you have to make as a professional. This next person says, it sounds like necessary procedures for VC can't be set up on the fly. For example, if the attorney requests, my clients in the county jail, can you zoom in and assess them? You know, it's hard to set up like safety precautions, for example. Would you agree with this statement? And then the person says, ideally, this requires much advanced coordination with the originating site. Yeah, it does require that coordination. And so, as I stated, I really recommend working those procedures out ahead of time and having that relationship with the, the jails or the, the uh, hospital settings, or if there's some other kind of office setting that you're doing this um, to, is that you wanna set up those procedures well ahead of time and have a good relationship with, with those folks so that if you are um, even having a technical issue, you can work with them to resolve the technical issue. One of the challenges that we had here in Washington was that some of the counties that we were, we were doing this to are fairly remote and they don't have like IT departments. You know, one of the, the deputies is their IT professional. And so if they had a technical problem, like they couldn't make the connection for whatever reason, they had to call someone from their staff to come in from the office, like a deputy to come in and work on it, troubleshoot it. And so that's why I recommend um, setting the stuff up, um, the session up a bit ahead of time before you move the client in and um, having that on-site staff identified on who you can speak to on whatever shift or day of the week it is um, and have that procedure in place so that the, the um, originating site, they have the procedures too, so they know what to do and they know what to expect when uh, it's time to do a session. 
This next individual says, my understanding is that the requirement to use a HIPAA compliant teleconference platform applies to the transmission of PHI, not healthcare services per se. Is your understanding different? Uh, obviously those things blend in together because you can you can do health information but without P PHI and then, it, you know what I'm saying? So it's really that they're kind of, they're obviously connected. So I, I'd say, yeah, you're right. It's really the PHI part. Um, Again, I go back to recommending using the HIPAA compliant software to do it. Then you're just then you have that uh, peace of mind. Like you're you're using if it gets challenged, you can say, look, it's it meets all the HIPAA requirements. It's encrypted, and then uh, peace of mind. What ideas or suggestions do you have when your tele evals are completed across community sites throughout an entire state from various organizations? or with uh, individuals from their personal residence as far as safety measures are concerned? Yeah, so there's uh, a couple of those papers that I, I showed you and I'd be happy to send to you about safety plan. We get really into that, like doing stuff from the home or to the home, some of those particular concerns you'll, you'll have or, or recommendations for safety planning regarding that versus settings that have staff on site because it's different. Um, but you have to be prepared for those types of settings. Um, so if you don't have clinical staff on site, um, knowing how to uh, resolve a, an emergency if it, if it happens, who to call. One of the things that um, I think has been improved over the years, but um, previously when you called 911, like from your location, you're calling 911 in your exchange area, not the place location or the county where the client is. So that's something to really consider. So you better know the address and the location um, of that distant site, uh, particularly if you're going to a place that's say an attorney's office, for example, you're gonna to wanna to know where that is. And again, always have an alternate contact phone number so you can call that office uh, if something happens. And you know, it can happen where you're right in the middle of a session and um, all of a sudden you, you lose the connection. So you don't know what's going on. You're, you, know, you, you can't see it. So you better have an alternative, call somebody to get a resolution on the site and make sure that wherever it is you're calling, they know what the procedures are, again, what those expectations are. And then always think about having an alternative. It's something we did here in Washington, like we always set it up to where we're gonna do video conferencing, but if for some reason we can't, for whatever reason, maybe the attorney says, no, they don't wanna do it, or we know we're gonna have, there's a technical problem that happens, we always have an alternative for going out on site if necessary. Most of this individual's psychiatric service sites require someone uh, be in the room if a computer is being utilized. So I guess someone in addition to the person they're evaluating for, for safety reasons. The person that's in the room does not participate in the evaluation. Is this problematic? Um, I think it depends on your, your local um, jurisdiction and what... Um, uh, what's advised in, in your setting. Um, I, I've certainly been in scenarios where we have the correctional officer in the corner of the room for safety reasons. Uh, I've been in settings where um, it's like giant glass, plexiglass walls separating so that there's, so that correctional officers can see the, um, the client uh, while you're interviewing. So you have that kind of visual uh, for safety reasons primarily. Um, and then there's the issue of, of, of privacy and, and, and all that. Um, my preference is for, for privacy. And I think most probably is the case for most professionals is you, your client, you want them to feel that they can, um, what, they're, what they're telling to you is, you know, private and that they're not feeling that they're being um, uh, observed or, or um, putting themselves at risk for something or because there's a correctional officer who's in the room. And so, um, my recommendation is to aim towards that for the as, as much privacy as you can possibly do. But if it's not feasible, I'd, I'd include that in the report too. So if there was a, an officer in, in the room for safety reasons, for example, um, you put that in the report, just as you would put in your report that the attorney was present. Can you speak to forms and informed consent and is verbal consent enough? I think it depends on your jurisdiction, um, what, the, what the requirements are. Uh, there's a, a literature on this. 
Um, it was actually one of the topics that we talked about in a couple of the, the published papers that I referred to earlier. Uh, depends on what those requirements are um, in your jurisdiction. Uh, you can do it certainly verbally and um, you do, a, I guess you call it a notification procedure. So you're notifying uh, your client uh, rather than a, a written kind of consent form for doing it. I do recommend just as I would in doing this in a healthcare setting is that you need to talk about the, the medium and that you're gonna be using video conferencing and um, whether or not you're recording it or not should be disclosed. And obviously using the technology makes it a lot easier to record it. You know what I mean? It's like you can just hit a button and you're like, like a Zoom call. And so uh, making that clear. And um, again, always asking those questions about can they hear you and see you okay while you're doing it. And then making it clear that they can ask you to, you know, turn it up or if they're having problems hearing you that you can uh, turn up the volume. And then I also recommend checking in with them, as I said before, along the way, because for some reason they, they might not hear you and they said they did it first, but now they actually don't. So checking in with them to make sure that they can hear you okay. Do you know about any research on disability evals by VC? Mm, good question. Um, I'm not that familiar with that literature. It seems like I've, I've reviewed some of it in the past, just kind of been doing this in general. Um, there's definitely a, a broader literature on this regarding in the case of um, just doing, providing health services. Um, and I'd recommend um, just reviewing the literature on it and seeing what you can find. Do you have any recommendation on VC software pros and cons? Yeah, well, some of the, the neat things about programs these days is that they have some other features to them. Like you can have like the waiting room, you know, things you can kind of set it up to where you can allow people in um, or have them sort of wait in a waiting room. Some have a whiteboard function where you can do visuals on the screen. Uh, this can be used for some types of um, testing or showing documents, um, showing surveys, et cetera. Um, so I, I, you know, those, if, you, if those are important to you and what you're doing, then I would look at the software programs that allow that. Doxy has some pretty neat features like that, for example. Um, there's one other point that's made me think of, I, I wanted to mention too, is, is Verifying the identity of the person on the other end. This is a big deal when doing certainly doing it in healthcare because you might be calling someone who you've not met before and like verifying who they are with their ID. You want to do that in the initial setting. Obviously, with a, a client who's in a uh, in a jail setting or in a hospital, you know that they you know who they are because they're, you're requesting the staff to bring them into the room. But sometimes you might have like an attorney who's like a, it's like a three way call. Like, do you really know who that attorney is? That third person on the on the call, right? And so doing upfront, making sure you identify who that person is. And when they come on, making sure that they identify themselves. Um, and you'll have a record of it, obviously, but um, I don't think the risk is super high, but um, it is nonetheless a risk that you've got someone who's connected on your connection who's not who they say that they are. So always ask. How would you write up in your report the lack of information gathered from BC on things like hygiene or ambulation? Yeah, excellent question. Um, I think that, um, again, it's a clinical, to me, it's a clinical judgment thing. So if you think that you're missing some information because you're, you're partially uh, detecting certain things, but, you're, you're, but you know that you're missing some things, um, you, you might want to indicate that and say that um, these things, I would be clear that they were not observed. Um, and if you have any information on that person, like a previous report, then in your, in your, in there's stuff in there about some of these things, but you're not able to observe them and you think that's relevant, then you're going to want to indicate that in your report that you did not observe these things. Um, and, and because of the video conferencing um, uh, medium that was used, um, but again, it's, it's your kind of your, your judgment, your clinical judgment and doing it. And um, if you think it's important and you're not able to observe it, then I recommend do it in person then. Do you think that 
VC is going to remain and say that it's here to stay even after COVID goes away? Yeah, I think it is. I, I think that its benefits are really proving itself. Um, you know, there may be some reversion back to doing things in person, uh, certainly in doing uh, forensic evaluations. Um, that'll be driven by what, what the courts want and what, you know, if things get challenged in, in jurisdictions, then there might be a move back towards that. Um, but I don't know, it's, it's like with everything else, when you start seeing the benefits of something, if they outweigh the cons, then th there's a tendency to continue with it. So I'm anticipating that we will continue with it. Next question is, what is your perspective on defense attorneys challenging telecompetency evals based on Daubert and lack of empirical evidence supporting evaluations conducted in this matter? Well, I refer them to the, the literature that we've been publishing and the, the literature that's coming out this year. Um, is a, I, I've been watching it, there's been other articles and people um, starting to report on their use of video conferencing in forensic settings, forensic settings, so, settings, so, settings, so. And as I said in my presentation that if you draw the parallel with just healthcare, doing televideo stuff for healthcare, that there's decades of evidence of it being used and, and being successfully used. And so as a kind of a comparator, I, I'd say, well, show me that it's not. Show me that it's not, doesn't have an evidence base. Show me that it's not as valid. And there's a few examples where, as we just talked about, where it might have, it does have its limitations and you have to address those. But um, I think there's a pretty strong and growing evidence base for its reliability. This is a pretty broad question. Um, but this person's asking you to talk a little bit about detecting malingering. <laughs> yeah, yeah, interesting. Uh, you know, I, I kind of think of it as, and I think about when I do anything with video conferencing for, for healthcare uh, for, and in forensic settings, is that um, I think of it as being the same as you're doing as in person, it's just the medium is different. You're looking through this little square, right? And so I think anything that you would observe in a person um, malingering in person, you're going to see it over video conferencing. Um, you're you're, you're going to ask the same types of questions. Um, you're going to observe it just as you would as in person. Um, is it easier to malinger over video conferencing might be part of that question. Um, I don't think so, but I don't know the answer to that. Um, but my hunch is that it's not any easier. Rachel, did you want to make a quick announcement? Sorry, I was sharing my screen for folks to get uh, access to the QR code, but the eval is also in the um, chat. Perfect. And then also just to let everybody know, we are approaching the hour mark. So officially um, this lecture is over, um, but we are going to stay on a little bit longer to continue to answer your questions. Um, so in, in line with our previous uh, question, do you think people are more or less likely to feign over VC? I don't think they're more or less likely to. It's an interesting question. I have to think about that for a minute. Are they, are they is it easier to <laughs> if they were going to? Um, I don't think so. Um, but that's, that's my own um, experience of it. Um, you know, there is a sense of when you're doing video conferencing that there's sort of this, this distance, right? If you feel even just psychologically more distant from the person you're speaking with. And I kind of wonder if that could play some role in that too, that because they're not in the same room as you, that that, that interpersonal that kind of uh, interaction is a little bit different. In my experience of doing anything with video conferencing that over time it becomes, um, you start to forget about it. Like you're just, you're just having a conversation with someone um, through this te technology and you, and you stop, you kind of forget it, that you're not in the same room with them. Um, that's been my experience. Do you have any resources that would be relevant for civil cases or child custody evaluations? Yeah, I would check out some of the, the publications from one of my colleagues, um, 
uh, Fran Lexen. She's um, kind of leading, she's a child psychologist, forensic psychologist here in the state of Washington. Uh, we've done a couple of papers together. Uh, she's been kind of a pioneer of doing video conferencing with children. And um, we've reviewed some of that um, literature in some of our papers. Um, I think she's got one or two others that get into this a bit more. Um, but I recommend checking out that literature. Thank you. Um, what suggestions can you give to help convince attorneys and courts the value of using VC for, for forensic evals? Yeah, um, I think I think it depends on um, I guess how they're how they are approaching it. So if they're really adamant about it and it is what it is, but you know, showing them the, these lit reviews, like here's articles, publications, um, it's being done, and um, as I've been approached, as I said a few times, where with attorneys on both sides uh, challenging it or wanting to do it, and um, I've I've done statements, you know, for, in my opinion, very good arguments for why it's just as valid and reliable as doing it in person, and acknowledging what the limitations are. And also acknowledging there are some scenarios where it may be not be advised to do, but in the majority of them, I think it is just as reliable and valid. And um, I think the literature again speaks for itself. Do you have template instructions for uh, VC uh, with evaluees in the community? This person says every few months she needs to update hers to account for a bizarre situation she's encountered, such as the evaluee presenting in their underwear while cooking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, I've experienced stuff like that too, where like, you know, I had, I was working with someone they, and they ordered pizza, you know, like a, the pizza person showed up during the session, you know, or the, the dog comes in, the dog is jumping on the, all around the room and stuff like crazy stuff. So, um, setting your rules up front uh, with the person, you know, and it's, yeah, they're more likely to do things that are a bit more um, uh, out of the ordinary. If they're in their home environment, you know, they're not in the office with you or in, a, in a, another uh, supervised setting, uh, indeed. And so I would set what those rules are up front. And then, um, you know, at the time of the session, you know, it, one thing that gets done a lot in the healthcare field is creating a, like a little, pamphlet or an information sheet, kind of like what you might add to a consent form, but just some information about procedures and um, giving that to the client um, or giving that to the attorney uh, and so that they kind of get a sense of expectations and procedures ahead of time. In Washington, we did create an email and we would send that email out to the attorneys and it was about setting up the session and we had a little bit of information there along these lines and to really get that communication going with the attorney regarding doing a video conferencing session. And we found that to be pretty helpful. It's kind of like a, an information paper, I'd call it almost like a little pamphlet type of thing or flyer. Um, so I recommend establishing something like that. Um, given that hands-on testing is not appropriate for VC assessment, if there's not an assistant on site, what cognitive measures would you recommend that can be used virtually and that hold up in court? That's why I showed you that article, that neuropsychological testing paper. Got to read it because we reviewed all that. And um, I recommend reading that and what's what's been done in the past, what hasn't been done. And often what you'll find in this field is that there isn't like a hard rule about it. Like there is like the publisher is not going to say you can't do this with video conferencing. But really the, the test of it is what's been done and like what's the precedence for doing it. And so that's why looking at this literature on it and saying, well, this, these tools have been used for video conferencing. There's actually some studies where they've, they've assessed its reliability or validity uh, and using that to back it up. Um, but in my opinion, there's really no hard rule about that. It's just what's been, what, what evidence is there um, in regards to using the particular tool. Where there are other rules are things like I said before, where there's like a security concern, where it's you have to have hands on to it, uh, those kinds of things. Um, th those to me are, are harder rules. And if it is something that requires the hands on and there's just no way you can do it because there's no one, there's not a technician on site who can assist, then that's you can't do it. And so you'd have to do either not do that type of testing or try to find a way to do it in person. So 
so this person, this is more of a comment. Um, they've had cases in their area in which jail inmates have been multitasking during video conferencing evals, for example, looking at other things on the internet or on the laptops. Any thoughts about this or how to avoid it or how to address it? Yeah, problem. So uh, what I recommend is the way that we did it here in Washington is like these systems were locked down. So they were video conferencing only, only for that session. They didn't have access to anything else. And they were being you know, escorted in and observed and so forth for the most part. Um, so I think if you have ways of locking the stuff down, uh, and there, the, you can do that obviously with, with browsers and things, you can lo lock stuff. Um, the other thing I'd recommend is that if you're in a scenario where you can't lock the stuff down like that, is again, in that initial discussion or in a written instruction uh, up front is like you state those expectations that during the session we'll be doing video conferencing, uh, please do not, um, you know, do other things other than, you know, going through the session. And uh, so at least they, they're hearing it from you. And then if you observe those things happening as a uh, professional, address them during that session. Say, I notice that you're, you're looking at something, um, you know, so point it out and work with them. Um, make sure that the area, the location is, if you have control over it, doesn't have anything that's gonna get their attention or cause a problem. Um, I, I wanna come back to one more thing about this, about the, the pan tilt zoom issue is that if you can't see the whole room, you're gonna run into some problems because they, they could get up and pay, start pacing. It happens all the time. People get up, they pace or they go off camera and that's a real problem. So I would try to set it up, it can be a problem. So I, I'd set it up to where you can see the whole room in case that happens and then, um, uh, if you have pan and tilt zoom, then you can use that if you need it. So I know you went over a couple of things about maybe certain individuals that might not be appropriate for VC. Um, besides the ones that you mentioned, any other points to consider about appropriateness and in individuals or measures that might be helpful to help people determine if someone is appropriate? Yeah, you know, one of the things is just a person may just not want to participate in it. Like, you know, and maybe because it's over video conferencing, maybe that's partly their reason, at least the reason that they give that they don't want to do it. They don't, they don't um, want to talk to a computer screen. If you're going to do this, do it in person. That may happen. I think I recall maybe one scenario where we had a client who did that during a session. Um, and so we, we addressed it, the person just refused. And so we addressed it by, okay, we'll have to do it in person. And so they rescheduled it because uh, they refused to participate in it. And so that's a question for, for you as a professional and what you do in those scenarios. Like um, if they refuse to do it, do you go out of your way to do it in person? Um, that's something you have to decide and, um, and how you work with that person or that person's attorney. Um, another thing that could come up is, um, again, the, this kind of the psychotic features. And as I, I gave you one example where the person thought the, the forensic evaluator was a robot. And just because of the technology itself, the medium can kind of trigger some of that stuff when you think about, uh, you know, hearing, hearing voices, uh, voices through the TV set, those kinds of things. I mean, you're talking voices over a set, right? So um, those things can actually come out more. And as I said, in this scenario, it actually provided more information about the person's mental state. And that was very valuable information during that person's assessment. But there could be scenarios where it's just, um, they just refuse to use it because of the technology. Um, you'll have to make that assessment while you're doing. If you know something about the person's history, I always recommend that, previous reports, if you're gonna look at those ahead of time uh, to determine if that was an issue or not. Any suggestions for convincing colleagues to conduct VC assessment who continue to put other people at potential risk by agreeing to conduct competency evals in a jail or other high-risk environment? Yeah, well, let me tell you, this was something that I experienced here uh, in Washington, because I'm a, obviously a proponent for this and a driver of it. And we had um, 
uh, I would say maybe one or two, you know, evaluators who were free resistant. They were doing things the, the old fashioned way <laughs> and they were refusing anything with the technology, fumbling around with the remotes and the, they just couldn't do it, you know, which I, I was very suspicious of. Um, so what I did is I became just an advocate for it. So uh, I went out and I did the trainings and I, I we, let's do a dry run, let's do a practice run, you know, to get them, get over their, their concerns about it and let them try it out. And then finding local champions. So finding evaluators who are really, maybe it's you, you know, that you're, you find that, hey, this is working. It works for me. I like it. Now you become an advocate for it or a champion for it. And so you become the person who's training others, um, encouraging them to do it, consulting a bit on it if they're having an issue or as a professional. Um, that's what I recommend um, because people will be, you know, we're, we're creatures of habit. We want to do things the way we've always done them usually. And so uh, there, you might experience some resistance to it. Absolutely. You'll find that with attorneys too. It's the same thing as they just, it's novel. They don't, they don't trust it. You know, you trust what you don't know or understand, right? You don't trust what you don't understand. Any um, special considerations or thoughts about evaluating juveniles who are often at home? Yeah, there's, there's some good literature on this. As I mentioned, Dr. Lexon's work uh, and some others. Um, in fact, there's um, some guidelines, which I actually helped with, uh, published by the ATA, American Telemedicine Asso Association, regarding working with um, children and juveniles, doing video conferencing, some guidelines. I recommend you check those out. Uh, one of the issues that you have there is that a couple things. You have parents or guardian present, right? So you got to think about that uh, in the assessment. Um, often with children, um, they're um, jumping around the room, you know, and so you're trying to do some kind of evaluation when they're they're more active in the space. Um, folks can be younger folks, or really anyone can be distracted, you know. And so if you mentioned like someone mentioned about using the internet or video games on the internet or something, uh, something to really you know be paying attention to. And uh, working with whoever is on site, whether it's the guardian or some other staff, to help set up the, um, the setting and talk about the expectations and, um, and work through it with your clients. If you get a court order for family therapy and one parent and kids live in the same state as the psychologist, but the other parents in a different state, is there any option for VC besides getting a temporary license? Uh, good question. That's one thing I did not get into in this presentation because it was meant to be more focused just on forensic evaluations. But this is a big deal in any kind of um, provision of healthcare um, using video conference or, or telemedicine because of the, the jurisdictional aspects of this licensure um, across jurisdictions. And it gets tricky like when you have these multi-way ones because um, but in general, what's relevant is the location of where um, the client is. So you needing to be licensed in that state. Um, now this is in the healthcare field um, and it applies to forensic psychologists. Um, I do know that if you are on, um, and this would not probably pertain to any of you, maybe some of you who are federal, like on a federal installation or, or working on behalf of the federal government, like I worked for the VA before, uh, or as a DOD psychologist, I could practice across any state line because I'm on a federal, I'm working on a federal capacity, right? But uh, for state stuff, um, it really depends on where the, the client is and you being a license where the client is. Boy, it gets in this weird gray area as you're, as you're referring to where you have another person involved in it who is in a different jurisdiction of where, where you're not licensed. And um, I don't know if I have the answer to that because I think it, um, it might depend really on what that relationship is. Are they actually your client or not? Uh, and if they're just a third person who you're not providing the service to, then maybe it doesn't apply. Um, I don't know. I would check with your, your local, um, you know, your state uh, licensure board maybe on that one uh, and see what you can find out. Do you know when the second edition of A Practitioner's Guide to Telemental Health is coming out? Well, we're just starting to, to write it now. And um, so it'll probably come out, gosh, maybe by the end of this year, possibly. They'll probably do an electronic version first. 
uh, or, the, or the, probably early by early next year. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm going to have a section there geared more towards uh, forensic settings. And we're also going to write a section on um, fatigue, Zoom fatigue, we're calling it uh, in general. It doesn't have to be just Zoom. But I can tell you, I've been teleworking myself for a year, and there is real experience of fatigue in doing this too. And um, I think that's something that we need to manage as professionals too when you're just doing it this way. I put it in the category of just pros and cons. You know, there's there are advantages of of going out and meeting with people and um, breaking up your routine. And, uh, but if you're doing the same thing every day in the same setting, it can get monotonous and you can ex certainly experience some fatigue from it. All right, we are 15 after. So I think this is a good stopping point, but thank you so much. This was a great talk and definitely needed in this day and age. Um, you know, we still have questions coming in. So people are certainly very, very interested in, in what you have to say. So we really appreciate your time. Thank you. You bet. And again, it was fast as I was compressing a lot in that little bit of time, but please feel free to reach out to me, check out the resources um, on my website and, and just shoot me an email. I'm happy to send them to you. Thank you yeah. so much. For those of you that are still on, you know, Dave has um, also done a presentation for, you know, the state of New Mexico and he was fantastic and he very responsive and a, a, a great resource. So for those of you that are working on developing, you know, VC programs, um, I definitely suggest reaching out to him. He's very, very helpful. So, all right, everyone, I'm going to turn it back over to Rachel and Anthony and Dave Ward. We're all good. Thank you again. Thank you so much. Take care. Take care. Thanks again, Dave. All right, I'm gonna shut it down. So if anybody needs the link and they weren't able to get it, you can just email us. Thanks so much. All right, have a good one.